We're going to talk about the agricultural workforce. Rupal Patel uh, from California Harvesters. Rupal is the Vice President of Sustainability Impact for the Renewable Resources Group, the RRG, where she leads the development of environmental and social impact programs for RGG's investment portfolio. Prior to joining RRG, Rupal gained a sense of experience engaging with environmental justice, labor, labor, poverty, and immigration issues while working for a variety of organizations. So I'd like to welcome you at this time, if you come forward. Hi. Okay, great. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, very excited to introduce um, a company that um, we created um, called California Harvesters, um, and it's an employee benefit company. I can go into the details of what that means, but effectively our um, uh, sort of goal was to create a socially responsible farm labor contracting company that is market-based, and um, this is our story. Um, so California Harvesters was um, uh, uh, developed through a partnership with a number of organizations, um, and it functions effectively like a worker-owned cooperative. So we reached out to uh, many cooperative developers around the uh, United States who have success in developing cooperative businesses that are focused on low-wage uh, immigrant um, low literate sectors um, of our economy. And so uh, much of what we developed as California Harvesters is based on proven strategies and structures that have been effective in addressing um, it issues in, in low wage immigrant workforce sectors. Um, so you'll see there's a, a number of different groups that we had engaged early on to um, help us develop this business. Um, and uh, in total, we raised uh, about $1.8 million to start and launch the business, and that was through um, uh, some grants um, from various foundations, but all, majority of the money is actually from, um, is, is actually low interest loans that were used to incubate the business. Um, so it is indeed market-based and, and sustainable. Um, we hired a um, very strong uh, management team that is based locally in the uh, Bakersfield, San Joaquin Valley. Um, Benny Parlin is our um, CEO. He has uh, four years of running his own farm labor contracting business. Um, uh, Myra Rodriguez, Javier Felix, um, our folks that have come from, Myra Rodriguez was on the safety and training side of a, a large table grape grower, Sunview, um, and uh, Javier Felix is another gentleman who, who's been working in the fields and supervising, coordinating labor for years. So, um, and then in addition, we hire also critical support staff for human resources, um, you know, additional field supervisors, um, so to, to be able to support the workforce um, and growers in, in terms of meeting quality and productivity guidelines. Um, so what do we seek to address? Um, so there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I think we're all familiar. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because I'm talking to uh, people who understand this very intimately. Um, but there's a, a couple of reasons for the labor shortage that we're experiencing in the, in the valley and, and elsewhere throughout the country, really, um, around farm work. And um, a lot of it has to do with a lack of immigration reform um, and elderly population that is now aging and is not asking, telling, encouraging their children to come work in the fields. But ultimately for us, what we saw uh, the big problem is that it's not a quality job. So frankly, you know, many, many workers are not entering the sector because there is a lack of stable and year-round employment. There is a lack of job training opportunities and it's low wages and few benefits, right? So we know that the contracting system is really made up of a lot of mom and pop kind of businesses that um, ha struggle with keeping up with regulatory issues and changes, et cetera. Um, and so what we seek to address is really the quality jobs angle of this um, and, and in turn uh, the quality workforce that is required to support growers in the business. <clears throat> so you are all very familiar with the, I'm sure with the farm labor contracting system where a grower contracts with a labor contractor, a labor contractor goes and recruits workers, they pay them the wages, you know, for the, for the labor that they put in and then the labor contractor will charge somewhere between a 30 to 50% premium over and above uh, labor costs. And what we, when we did some analysis of what the margins are for the business, you can get anywhere from two to 10% margin in that business. So it's not a huge, it's not a, a very lucrative business, but nonetheless, there is a lot, when you get to the scale of, you know, 
hundreds of workers being employed on a field, which translates to millions of dollars of payroll. A uh, 30 to 50 percent premium on top of that is, is um, significant. Um, and so well, the way California harvesters is structured is that instead of keeping the the margin, that two to 10 percent margin that most contractors will net, we take that money and we reinvest it back into the workforce. And so it functions as a cooperative in that way. Um, and you know, generally what, what we see is that the workforce delivery system is failing, so there's a couple things. There's not enough labor supply. It's a high-risk third-party system with increased joint liability for growers. Um, there's consumer and market pressures to really address you know, fair labor and transparent labor conditions. Um, and so, and that's on the grower side. On the farm worker side, it's inconsistent working conditions and income. There's limited training and um, opportunities to advance, and then there's very little access to benefits, housing, and financial tools. And then generally in the rural sectors, you know, we see just an, uh, an underinvestment um, to community infrastructure, childcare, housing, financial institutions that can really support this, this workforce. And so this, from our perspective, you know, affects the long-term profitability and sustainability of the sector, and um, that's what we seek to address here. So the solution for us was creating this sort of um, employee benefit company model um, where there is a recruitment advantage in a tight labor market because there is ability to share in profits and help to um, optimize efficiencies and productivity. Um, there's a demonstrated quality increase and cost decrease with um, employee benefit um, companies and worker-owned cooperatives generally, and so we're trying to translate that into this sector, which is much needed. Um, and the ability to codify and market a fair labor commitment. So growers are, you know, increasingly asked to be able to, um, you know, get certifications that, that show that they're, you know, sensitive to the environmental and, and social challenges of, of the agricultural industry. And so um, one of the things we're also pursuing is certification of the, as a farm labor contractor to help growers with that. Um, for workers, there's an opportunity to get, gain higher wages, benefits, training, and then the most important to them, frankly, is respect and dignity in the workplace. Um, workers get to participate in the profits and also in the trust model governance structure, and they, we provide an increased access to wraparound services, so childcare, um, immigration, um, housing services, things that would help them support and round out their job quality. And then, uh, finally, we, we do partner with affiliated 501c3 partners um, in the you know, Central Valley that are already servicing this workforce, but have challenges in actually getting connected to the workers directly. And so what we want to do is create, you know, be the sort of a market-based spoke um, in the center and with a wheel and ecosystem of support that, that we're, we're developing earnest partnerships to be able to provide some of the gaps that can't be provided by growers, at, you know, given the margins of the business and the challenges we're facing as an industry. Um, and so CHI is effectively a farm labor contracting company that's majority owned by a trust. Um, it's just very similar to a family trust or a land trust. And the sole purpose and mission of the trust is to benefit workers. And so you'll see this is the trust model. So effectively, California Harvesters is an incorporated company. Um, we hire employees. Um, like I had mentioned before, the trust is the sole shareholder of California Harvesters. So when employees work, you know, it's a to be determined, you know, consecutive, let's say a thousand consecutive days with California Harvesters, they would be automatically become members of the Farm Labor Trust. And as Farm Labor Trust members, they then have the opportunity to do two things critical to the business. One is elect to the board of directors. Um, and then the second is to be able to um, vote on how profits from the company get reinvested back into the company. And so this could be in the form of higher wages, um, benefits like childcare, healthcare. Um, it could be trainings that they deem that would be necessary. Um, so it's really based on the priorities and needs of the workforce. And I, I, at this stage, the board is not made up of any worker, workers because we're in, it's the second year of the launch. But the idea is, is that over time, we, in year three, four, five, six, we would start elect, having uh, worker representatives on the board and they would serve as the majority of the board. Um, and the idea, again, is to actually create some transparency in the system. So um, workers will get to, you know, be educated about the, how the business runs. Um, the, the financials of the business will be completely transparent so that they understand what the costs are for um, labor and running a business such as this. Um, and they'll get trainings to be able to serve on the board, et cetera. So it's very much based on co-op models. 
Um, so in 2018, we launched, um, in April of 2018, we launched, and um, it was quite successful. What The way we did it is, is most cooperatives um, succeed or fail based on two different factors. So one is you have to have workers that understand how to run a business, which is a challenge in and of itself. There's a lot of education that needs to happen in order to do that. And the second is, is that they usually have to go out and get market, you know, get clients. And that's usually where one or the other falls short and then you, the co-op doesn't succeed. And so what we said as investors is we own a company, Sunworld International, which is a large table grape company, uh, you know, requires at a minimum 1,500 workers year round. At a, at a peak, it needs 6,000 workers. So what we said is we'll be your anchor client. We will be the market force that helps you stabilize immediately. And then as, you know, because you have that stability, we can work on getting, you know, the workers educated about how to run the business, educate them about the promise that California Harvesters has for them. Um, so um, based on the margin that we were able to um, take that most farm labor contractors take and, you know, go invest in a hacienda in, in Mexico or whatnot, which is, you know, um, great. Um, we um, take that profit and we were able to, one, pay our workers 25 cents an hour more than uh, minimum wage. Um, and then we were also allowed to, uh, able to provide increased bonus incentives over and above what growers typically pay in the field. Um, we were also able to, through partnership with folks like um, Omni Healthcare and the other community clinics that are already servicing this population, we were able to offer a, a pretty a good healthcare plan for our employees that was completely subsidized. And then, um, in addition, they had to provide, a, at $11 a paycheck, they could um, completely provide coverage for all their dependents as well. So I just want to make clear, it's not ACA coverage, um, which is really cost prohibitive and we need to come up with a solution around that, but there is, you know, a great community clinic network in all of our rural areas and, and that those are the partners that we sought to um, work with. So in April of 2018, we started with 250 workers. By the end of the December uh, of that year, we were at over 900 workers. This was all word of mouth. 80% um, of the workforce was new to Sunworld, which was really interesting for us because it sort of helped us to um, validate that the labor shortage could actually be addressed if we were able to create a quality job environment for the workforce. 40% um, were new to the table grape industry, so through trainings and such, we were able to get them trained and, and uh, able to be more, um, have broad based skills across crop varieties. Um, there was a 45% retention rate, which is typical for, is pretty industry standard for the farm labor contracting industry. Um, we had a 52% increase in productivity, so we, we measured this very closely to say, okay, does the quality jobs um, uh, framework, is it effective? Um, and so uh, we did find that, you know, because especially since not some of our, a lot of our workers were new to the industry or new to table grapes, you know, what, what does the kind of meaningful engagement that we provide help to, you know, in productivity? Um, there was a 26% reduction in cost over the nine months that we were operating that first year. Um, and so overall, when Sunworld looked at California harvesters re relative to the other farm labor contractors that um, we employ, uh, we were at the end of the day 6% higher in costs in that first year than the others. So it wasn't terrible, but you know, given labor costs, it, every little bit helps. Um, it makes a difference. 73% um, of our workers' comp claims were resolved through modified field work, which is really extraordinary. We got um, insurance through the state health insurance, uh, state workers' insurance fund. Um, they are a huge fan of California harvesters and are always constantly looking to support us. And I, what I'll say is workers' comp is actually the highest cost center for farm labor contracting, so it's critically important that we rein those costs in and provide ways to keep those costs down. 70% um, were enrolled in Medi-Cal, um, and that was a very earnest effort on our part, too, to make sure that workers actually had access to the benefits that they're eligible for. And again, we worked with community clinics and local agencies to build that partnership and enroll them formally. Um, and then 54% of our employees also enrolled in the ancillary MEC plan, which provided um, coverage for mental health um, uh, coverage um, and chiropractic care, things that are outside of you know, the typical realm. And then um, by the end of the year, in addition to Sunworld, we had two other smaller clients. But Sunworld, in the first year, did represent 95% of our total sales. Um, and I don't know, it's not in here, but we did 11.5 million in um, uh, uh, top line revenues in that first year. 
Um, so uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is being transparent in the investment. Um, so both to growers and to workers, showing how every dollar that's spent for farm labor contracting services, where it goes. And so this is a pie chart that we provide to all our grower clients to let them know, you know, how the money, their money is being spent so that from a joint liability perspective, there's a lot of transparency there. Um, well, on workers' comp, this was by far the most surprising and successful part of the, the company. Um, so because it's the largest cost center, um, we really prioritize reducing um, risk of injury and burden for our workers. And um, through our efforts, the um, State Compensation Insurance Fund had provided a letter of recognition for us for our efforts in resolving our worker comp claims effectively. So some of the highlights from that letter was that we had timely reporting of injuries, so 74% of our claims were reported within five days. 17% within 10, and just made the connection between how reporting these and dealing with these claims immediately reduces costs by avoiding additional care, time off, disability litigation. Um, we boasted an incredibly low number of litigated claims in this first year um, by, by being earnest and communicating with our workers, our doctors, the claims team, and making sure that there was a resolution, immediate resolution to um, get the workers back to work as quickly as possible. And then what they said that the best um, thing about our, our company was that we took everyone back at modified work, which is very unusual for our farm labor contractors. And this saved money um, in temporary disability benefits, but also got the workers to heal faster and get back to work quickly. And so you'll see our, our um, comp rates also were um, reduced in 2019 as a reflection of our ability to manage claims effectively. So um, you'll see in each of the categories where we were, how um, we were. And what I'll say is the market actually did have a natural decrease in, in um, worker comp uh, costs for this year, but ours, uh, we had an additional 16% decrease over and above. Um, and in addition, we also um, brought in a, a, a third party auditor to come and audit the company in that first year to tell us, you know, where we're off, where we're, you know, on track and what needs to improve. And so um, there's the Fair Food Standards Council, which actually formed out in Florida. Um, and they have 14 retailer partners, including Costco, Whole Foods, Walmart. Um, that um, specifically on the East Coast, if, um, if you're certified under the Fair Food Program, uh, the retailers provide a premium back to the workers directly. Um, and so similar to Fair Trade or those, those other kind of programs. This program we liked in particular because it's very worker-driven and worker-centric. And so, um, but anyway, the, the, in, in the audit came out really well. Um, they interviewed 236 workers directly in the field. And uh, you'll see you know, the responses from the workforce. I like working here because workers are treated well. They treat you like a human. At other places, they'll talk to you like you're less than human, yell at you, and offend you. Um, here, I see a change. Women are respected, and they pay attention to workers. And this is the first company that cares about us. Um, in addition, we were able to provide trainings over and above the sort of 15-minute morning trainings that are typical in the industry. Um, so we had four, um, uh, probably I think a week total long of trainings that went um, in uh, throughout the months of the year. So in April, we did uh, communications, leadership, soft skills trainings. In June, it was sexual harassment, safety, team building, um, educating the workforce on the trust model and how this benefits them. Um, again, in October, workers' rights, complaint procedures, and in November, um, production best practices, which we thought was really important in terms of making sure that we're continuing to upskill the workforce. Um, and these were all paid trainings, and these were not reimbursed by the growers. They simply came out of the premium and the margin that we um, take and reinvest back to the workforce. So our launch results um, last year, uh, you know, was a challenging year, um, and we only did have one anchor client, so there was a little bit of a rough patch there. Um, but there were a couple factors that, you know, uh, led to um, our uh, uh, challenges. So one was climate change. Um, uh, you know, there were unseasonably hot, hot summers, um, and Sunworld has a policy where if it hits somewhere over 100 degrees at any point in the year, they pull the workers off. Um, and so instead of projecting what we thought were eight-hour days throughout the season, um, they ended up being five to six-hour days, so that hurt our revenues. Um, uh, the trade tariffs were obviously, uh, you know, an, an unexpected impact um, for the industry as a whole. Um, you know, just to put into perspective, the, the, the Chinese tariff, um, trade tariff was effectively uh, large uh, cost was more than it cost to produce a box of grapes. 
So we had a tremendous amount of the table grape industry had to reroute their fruit back into the domestic markets. It resulted in price depression. And at some point through the end of the year, um, it was cheaper to just let the fruit rot in the fields and actually hire the labor to harvest, which was um, heartbreaking. But it also led to cutting back our revenue uh, projections. And then just coordination with other farm labor contractors. Um, the politics of farm labor contracting is um, you all are intimately aware of. Um, so the farm labor contractors were um, threatened by the uh, California harvesters and um, you know sort of you know told Sunworld that if there was any favoritism that was going on there that they would take their business elsewhere. And so we had to really adapt and make sure that we were playing nice with everybody. Um, and so um, we expected to have a little bit more work with Sunworld, but we had to cut back some of the hours because we wanted to make sure we were playing fair with everyone. Um, and frankly, I just want to, I mean, after that first year, we are now an established company. We compete like every other. And so we got through the sort of growing pains of the startup there. Um, so uh, based on our projections, we had projected to do about um, 1.2 million hours with um, Sunworld. We only got to 800,000 build hours. Um, so we did do an 11.5 million in sales overall. You'll see um, our cost of goods sold and our overhead were in line with where we, you know, thought we should be. Um, but uh, because of the, you know, impact in the industry, we were also affected. And in 2019, you know, this year we had a couple objectives. So one was to go ahead and expand our client base, learning that, you know, starting a, a, a company with just one sole anchor client isn't an effective way to, to run a business. And so um, we are now at nine clients um, total, um, and it's um, citrus, almonds, uh, and table grapes, um, also nurseries and pack houses. And then um, we are looking to expand into berries um, by next year and expand our almond uh, uh, production too as well. Um, we are looking to really leverage, like I said, the, the point of you know us being a spoke in the wheel, a market-based you know labor services company, but being surrounded by an ecosystem of services. We're very fortunate to be in the great state of California who really, you know, respects and, and um, honors this workforce and provides the kind of funding and resources available to the, to the to work, um, so to the workers. So CalVans is a, obviously, a, I'm sure, a, 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 a partnership that you guys are very familiar with. Um, we are working with CalVans to try to pilot a program at California Harvesters. There are challenges with, um, it's a voluntary program, so, so crew bosses actually aren't paid to provide rides and it's a federal DOL regulation that requires, you know, prohibits us from doing so. It's resulted in us not being able to onboard the, the, pro the partnership right away because workers are sort of like, why would I do this if I'm not getting paid, which is completely reasonable. Um, and so we're trying to see what we can do creatively with the CalVans um, program to see how we can figure out a way to, to circumvent some of those DOL uh, regs. Um, employment training panel, you know, the ETP is great with the ag sector in particular and providing training dollars at a minimum of 200,000 up to, you know, a million dollars. Um, we did go before the employment training panel last year to consider an application for training dollars. Um, the staff was hugely supportive and we're very excited. When we got before the panel, they got a little gun shy about us being a farm labor contractor and the reputation that contractors have. And so we're recircling with, we worked a little bit through the governor's office to try to get, you know, into, um, to, uh, to reach the panel and ask them to reconsider our application. And so we're working through that process to share. Um, worker engagement is a real important part of this, the success of this company. And so we're, you know, implementing formal monthly needs assessment surveys and feedback process loops um, before we get the trust engaged so that we can continually understand where, what workers needs and how to prioritize those needs through um, earnest partnerships there. Childcare has been another um, avenue we've explored this year, specifically with the county, Kern County and the San Luis Obispo County, county um, child care providers. They've been really um, helpful in helping us understand what the challenges are there. And a lot of it has to do with um, federal poverty guidelines are actually too low for California. Um, so farm workers don't even meet the federal poverty guidelines. Um, they exceed them. And so we need to really work with the state earnestly to say, okay, how do we get a waiver or what can we do so that farm workers are actually eligible for the programs that are meant to be servicing them. 
Uh, fair food certification, we did have the fair food program come out again this year to do another audit. We're waiting for the report to come back and we're gonna be continuing to work with them to get certified as like one of the first farm labor certified companies. Um, and so then we can provide a, a, you know, some kind of premium back to our workforce and also for the growers, provide them an opportunity to go ahead and, and market themselves as a fair labor uh, grower through, through just contracting with us. Um, and in addition, Walmart Foundation is also um, launching a certification program. They're, they're certifying six farm labor contractors throughout the country, and California Harvesters was selected as one of the six that they're gonna be doing, so that's gonna be happening in 2020. And then overall, we wanted to establish an automate processes, so making investments in software and timekeeping um, uh, programs, um, and just really stabilizing and creating a good foundation so that our company can become more efficient and, um, and, um, and um, more efficient and more productive overall. Um, so that's, um, that's the presentation for now, and happy to answer any questions, and really appreciate your time and interest in this, because I, we, we have uh, many things we could be doing together, and so, um, you know, happy to talk about what those are. <laughs> We'll go ahead and open it up for questions. I had one. Um, so, so you're 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 essentially starting out with a small workforce and increased it to nine hundred. And actually, this year we're at, we were at twelve hundred. Right. So those people are coming from other farm labor contractors, I'm sure, because there's only a, there's a limited right. workforce. So. Are you getting pushback on that side as well from other contractors? To yeah, and taking quote their people? Um, yeah, so um, in the first year we got a lot of flack for it. Um, but the fact is is that this is happening all the time in the sector. So farm labor contractors are constantly poaching from other farm labor contractors and it's just, I agree with it's you. the game, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we play the game. Yep. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, First of all, I wanted to ask if they were intentional about choosing the acronym CHI as in CHI. I was like, oh, energy and CHI. Um, so I don't know if that was intentional, but I think it's very creative. Um, but uh, you know, I just wanted to commend you for your first year and those metrics that you were able to show. I mean, really demonstrates uh, not just the knowledge in this work, but really uh, I'm sure the collaborations and partnerships folks had to have. So I, you know, I was just curious is if there are other models like this in the agricultural world, are you the most, I, I mean, to me this is extremely innovative. I come from the workforce development world and um, I'm just really astounded by your numbers in the first couple of years. Yeah, so um, it, this is the, we're the first to do it in agriculture, um, but it's a, it's a model that's borrowed from um, the in-home supportive services. Um, in New York City, the largest uh, co-op is the Cooperative Home Care Associates. And uh, that's a 2,000 member cooperative. Uh, they started in 1992, several growing pains and learnings throughout the year. And we used that, we, we were partnered with them directly to help us learn from their mistakes and then also just really replicate the same model. And that's again, a low wage immigrant, low literate workforce. Um, and so we knew that that was, a, since that was a successful model, we just want to duplicate it and see if it can be effective in the agricultural sector. So we're the first. Great, congratulations Thank on what you. you're doing so far. Thank you. Um, back to Don's question on, on com competition for labor. Um, what about, uh, are you getting much conflict because you're going into the public realm for resources, whereas a lot of these private contractors do not do that? So are you getting even more pushback on because of that or not? Actually, no. Um, I'm not even sure that they know how we're funded. I think they probably assume that SunWorld... Um, funded it outright, or I'm not sure what they assume. But um, for us, it was really important to bring outside investment dollars and specifically philanthropic dollars and, and make sure that it is being spent effectively. Um, and so, you know, in addition to getting foundations to provide low interest loans to incubate the company, we also work with them to get grant dollars to be able to do, you know, other trainings and other things as well. So, um, and then just overall, you know, the nonprofits that the, most of these foundations support, making sure that we're connected to those nonprofits as well. So if there are services and such that we can partner on. So that was sort of, and then there's a lot of social capital out there, um, impact capital that's, you know, interested in the sector. May I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead. Um, I noticed, uh, I, I'm curious uh, about the composition of your board um, yeah. in, moving forward. Yeah. Um, I know in ag, 
one of the death knells oftentimes is a board, uh, cooperative board that has no outside directors. And so, uh, that's right. What is what is your intent? What is the intent there? Are you going to have outside directors and and uh, uh, active members or? Yeah, absolutely. So um, now, I mean, what I'll say is. We had to get through uh, the startup phase of this company. It was a little challenging, right? So we had a profit loss in the first year. This year, we're actually going to break even. So we um, we uh, made up for that loss um, and made, managed to employ 1,200 workers. So you know, all things are great there. Um, but we are looking to bring expand the board by March of this year. And the idea is to target folks um, in the grower industry that maybe so. For instance, Driscoll's direct or uh, writer affiliate companies, direct hires, so they're not going to necessarily um, uh, employ us as a farm labor contractor, but certainly they have expertise in being able to, you know, provide year-round work opportunities both on both sides of the border, um, and so they're a great board member for us to, you know, and credibility, you know, grim way. There's, there's folks that we would be attracting to that. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, and, and early on, you know, Secretary Ross and, and, and Jim Houston, who was deputy prior to us, um, were very helpful. And so, you know, now knowing that Jim's at, at, at uh, California Farm Bureau, you know, he would be a target. I mean, we're being very thoughtful about making sure that there's, this is credible and local and, um, and um, you know, dealing with the local issues very earnestly. So congratulations. I come from the co-op world. Oh, wonderful. So lovely yeah. to hear all about this. <laughs> I had a question, two questions. Uh, when you said the, the margin is 2 to 10%, do you mean that's your net net profit? That's right. Okay. And uh, when you said that the workers need to be trained to run the business, did you mean as board members? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, things like, so um, workers' compensation is... Um, is directly impacted by how workers behave in the fields, right? So it's really showing them that if we are doing, if we are, you know, uh, abiding by safety laws, being much careful in the fields, you know, doing reporting claims timely, et cetera, this impacts the profitability of the company, and that means there's more money in your pocket as a result, right? So that's the kind of training is like really understanding how the business runs and how you can maximize profits in this business so that it benefits you directly. Thank you. Yeah. So I actually had a couple questions for you too. Um, what? How big is your staff? Paid staff? Yeah. And, um, so it's it's eight, it's eight staff people. Um, so we have a, a CEO that runs it. Um, we have an operations director, field supervisors, and HR and payroll staff. Um, so it's eight total right now. And as we get more clients on board, we don't anticipate the back office having to expand necessarily, but certainly the supervision in the fields is where we would do the expansion. And that's a great opportunity for career growth. So many of our workers, we've already taken some of our workers and promoted them to crew bosses and then crew bosses to supervisors. So we're trying to create that path. And then do you use any H-2A workers? We don't currently, but it's something that we're exploring a partnership around. Um, because one of the th challenges of the workforce is really that um, bad habits have, you know, developed over decades of not having positive work environments. Um, and so, um, you know, they maybe don't want to show up for work or they, you know, I, you know, there's lots of things that we will probably, I shouldn't say at this meeting, but um, so um, there, so I think part of it is really showing them that, okay, if, if you don't want to go, if you don't want year round work, then we're going to have to bring workers from across the border in. But we'll do it in a way that's fair and equitable and safe, right? So the idea really is let's take the third-party middleman out of the system um, because that's where all the risk and exploitation generally occurs. And let's create a professionalized and capitalized services company that can serve growers on both sides of the border. And do you have a relationship with a bank? currently where you have backing if you need it? Uh, no, so one of the things, uh, and this is the, sh the challenges with you know, social enterprise startups, is uh, you know, we had a profit loss in the first year. Most banks, you need to show you know, six months of profitability, et cetera. We did reach out to Community Vision, which is a, a CDFI in um, Fresno. 
um, that is very interested in supporting us, but they can't. We just can't get past the typical lending requirements, and so we're looking to like sort of VC type social capital that's available out there to help us um, get to our next growth phase here. Right. Fascinating. Really appreciate your presentation. Do we have any other questions, Bryce? It is uh, fascinating. I, I have a, maybe a little bit of hard time getting uh, you know, wrapping my head around all the complexities. Um, are, are you a formal cooperative? Uh, and so could you participate in the bank of cooperatives? Um, so so um, I, we need to explore this a bit further. The, the challenges around them being a, being a co-op, a worker-owned business, is um, immigration status issues. Um, and so we set up the pr uh, company to be direct employees and then set up the trust to serve, you know, oversee it. And it was mostly because we knew it would be challenging for the workforce otherwise. I think eventually we could turn to a co-op model once the workers are more vested and understand how to, you know, how this is supposed to work. Um, but right now I don't think we, I, I'm not sure that we would qualify. Yeah, and then y y you're, f you're functioning as, as a, uh, a labor contractor with a different model. Yeah. And um, are, are your, uh, your your team members organized, or you're organizing? Or they're essentially working as engaged labor, fully involved owner operator type of, of, of labor. But as far as just representation, you fun don't function as a um, as a um, uh, like uh, a union. Yeah, right. No, no. And then because of the way you organize, um, are, are you? Um, do you have? Follow all the wage and hour laws. Um, Absolutely. Um, I mean, I have a neighboring cooperative that because they have um, organized labor, they they don't have to follow all the same rules that we do because they're organized, right? And they can write their own their own agreements with the um, right. But oh yeah, I like that seventy-two hour rule or the seven day uh, seven days in a row type things. But um, yeah. Anyway, very good. Uh, anything that we can do for you that uh, would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, so I think um, part of what's really critical around this is the ecosystem piece um, and really trying to figure out, there's, like I said, many great state programs that are run out of the Department of Education, Department of Social Services um, that can support this workforce, but there's, the requirements don't really allow for earnest participation from the workforce because there's, you know, things that just haven't been thought through and maybe they're not getting feedback directly from the workers on why they can't take advantage of CalVans or why they won't take advantage of um, certain childcare programs available, et cetera. And so to the extent that we can get some collaboration between the state departments around this, um, really thinking through creatively on how can we modify the child care uh, poverty guidelines so that our workers are actually eligible? Um, how can we work with CalVans to actually allow for some kind of reimbursement of costs and wages for the extra time that people are spending to drive people around? Um, those kinds of issues would be really helpful for us. I mean, I think... Um, just to have the state more involved and in, in, uh, looking at what, can, what are the tweaks that we can make and what kind of maybe additional funding can we allocate at the budgetary level to be able to fill some of these gaps um, would be immensely helpful. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Unfortunately, we, we've gotten behind schedule. I apologize. <laughs> So we'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, the Cal Cannabis update. Richard Parrott, uh, California Department of Food and Ag. Richard is director of the California Department of Food and Ag's Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing Division. As director, Richard oversees the implementation of uh, the cultivation, licensing, compliance, and enforcement programs for medicinal and adult use cannabis. Welcome. Um, good afternoon, Secretary Ross and President Cameron. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I was going to um, introduce myself and talk about what I do, but you did that for me, so thank you very much. Um, there, there are folders. There are folders being passed out to each of you that I'm going to um, refer to information in those folders as I go through my update. Um, thank you again for having me here today. Um, just to start off, I do want to remind everyone that in the, the world of licensing cannabis, there are three agencies in the state of California that license cannabis. I'll refer to our two sister agencies first. Um, in the Department of Consumer Affairs, there's the Bureau of Cannabis Control, 
Um, they license uh, and regulate distribution, testing labs, retailers, and micro businesses. In the California Department of Public Health, there's the Manufactured Cannabis Safety Branch, and they license and regulate manufacturers. And then we have um, Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing within Department of Food and Agriculture. We license and regulate um, cultivation, and we're also the agency that um, is responsible for administering the statewide track and trace system, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, all of our regulations um, for all the agencies are focused on protecting the environment and protection of public health and safety. In the packet uh, is the first page on the right that talks about what we do. Um, I just touched on that. There are also references some projects coming in 2021 down on the bottom right of that um, first sheet, and I'll talk about that towards the end of my presentation. Behind that sheet, uh, there's a page that talks about the different license types that we issue here at Cal Cannabis for cultivation. We issue 17 different license types. Um, the, the types are based on style of growing and also the size of the grow. So when I say style of growing, that's either indoor, outdoor, or mixed light. That's the type of cultivation practice. And then the size ranges um, from the smallest being specialty cottage all the way up to what currently the largest um, license we issue is a medium license. Large licenses are prohibited by statute until January 1st of 2023. Additionally, we issue nursery licenses um, and processor licenses. And just to note for all of you, the processor license is a license that was created through our regulations. All the rest of those were created in statute in the uh, Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. So there are fees for applications as well as for the license, and that's on the next page. Um, they, the applicant pays a one-time application fee the fee is, uh, was developed, both um, the application fees and license fees were developed in, by an economist for us as we were drafting our regulations. The fees are designed to cover the cost of our licensing, compliance, and enforcement program. Um, no more or no less, it's to cover our costs of administering the program. The fees were uh, uh, broken up and tiered based on the estimated annual output of the particular size of the license, both for the application fee and the license fee. Note that the, the um, chart shows that that is a license and renewal fee. Licenses are valid for 12 months um, from the date issued, and then they're required to be renewed annually after that. There is no fee for a renewal application, but the, the um, license holder is required to pay that renewal fee to maintain the license. Right now we're issuing um, what are called provisional licenses or annual licenses. Um, and back in 2018, we were issuing temporary licenses. Those have now the authority to issue temporary sunset at the end of 2018. Um, so the two different license types, uh, if, if a business, if a cultivator or a nursery or processor intends to obtain a license, they submit an annual application to us. Our staff reviews that application if that applicant meets all of the uh, requirements, both in the statute and our regulations for an annual license, then we'll issue the annual license. If the applicant is in a jurisdiction where they are in the process of working on compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, um, there was language put in the statute back in 20, um, uh, 2018 um, that created a provisional license. And a provisional license is allowed to be issued if that applicant demonstrates that they uh, compliance with CEQA is underway, which means they're working with their local jurisdiction. Um, a lot of jurisdictions across the state, as we were exiting the uh, temporary licensing phase and moving toward annuals, a lot of the jurisdictions were still doing a lot of work um, to be able to get to um, qualifying for annual licenses, so we have provisional licenses. Um, authority to issue provisional licenses currently sunsets in 2022. Okay, but provisionals upon issuance are valid for 12 months. Those two can be renewed at the discretion of the licensing authority as long as that applicant demonstrates that they are diligently working towards um, qualifying for an annual license, which in most cases means they're working with their local jurisdiction on compliance with CEQA. Uh, behind the sheet with the fees, I have current statistics for all of you. Uh, these statistics are fresh as of this morning. 
Um, so it's the one page sheet, it says 2019 statistics. These are our numbers as of today. Um, we have 422 active annual licenses. We have 3,405 active provisional licenses. We have another 982 that have been approved and they just need to submit payment for that license and that license will become active. And we have 1,281 applications that are um, still in in-house that are under review. 95% um, of those applications we're awaiting for information from that applicant to send back to us um, to fulfill what we call a deficiency notice where we advise that they're missing some critical information that would allow them to get at a minimum to a provisional license, if not to a full annual license. Does the annual license um, give me the right to open shop in the city of Sacramento or do I have to have a separate license from the city of Sacramento and this license to open up my shop? Good question. Thank you for asking. Um, I should have touched on that at the beginning. In, in California, it is a dual licensing system. So you do need local approval. Um, before we will issue the state license, we engage with the local jurisdiction where that applicant is located. So if you're in the city of Sacramento, we will be contacting city of Sacramento, letting them know you've applied with us. Um, do they um, approve or deny of us issuing you a state license? So we do have a, um, a team within our division that is what we call our local verification unit. They correspond directly with local points of contact. Um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, as the lead cannabis agency in the statutes, maintains a list for all agencies of who those local points of contacts are for all jurisdictions throughout the state. So yes, you do need both a local approval and state license to be able to open up shop. And Richard, <clears throat> yes. do you have um, any numbers or estimates on how many applications, new applications, you're still receiving on a weekly or monthly basis? Um, I'd say on average, we're getting anywhere between 60 to, uh, we've ha seen about, I'd say 6,200 new, um, kind of trickling in since about aug late August, early September. Okay. Um, and those are, you know, a mix of people who, um, you know, may have been um, trying to get their business kind of in order before they start applying. And we do encourage when um, prospective applicants contact us, we do encourage them to kind of have their business plan ready, really engage with their locals, start that conversation. Um, we want them to be engaged with the locals before they start up making application with us. And then in our um, in the, the second part of the statistics, touch on our compliance and enforcement work. So we do have compliance staff and enforcement staff. staff um, they are based throughout the state regionally. Um, they, uh, we perform compliance work. Um, that's gonna be typical inspections, um, education for our licensees. We're still focused on education out there, making sure that the licensees know what it is that they need to do to comply with the laws. And then enforcement, it's a mix of both activity for licensed um, uh, license holders, but also we do work with partner agencies, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Water Board, um, and local law enforcement. When there, is, there are complaints or information about unlicensed activity, we do um, cooperate with those agencies and assist as needed. So down below there on the statistics sheet, just some information about uh, 2019 work, um, 750 licenses inspected for compliance. And when I say licenses, we do have um, cultivators that do hold multiple licenses. And so we could go to one site and be performing an inspection on about, you know, uh, multiple licensed parcels on that one site. It could be three, four, five, um, just depends on how many licenses that license holder has. We've assisted on 90 search warrants so far this year. Once again, those aren't our search warrants. Those are search warrants that have been issued by either um, law enforcement or Department of Fish and Wildlife where they have um, called us to come and assist on those. Generally, what we'd be doing out there um, is measuring the size of the grow that was unlicensed or essentially the canopy size. Um, that information is used if there are going to be um, if, if the uh, law enforcement or partner agencies are going to pursue any type of civil action, um, they could uh, pursue penalties up to three times the license fee, so they would need to know what type of license that business should have had or that site should have had. And then finally, um, we've received 408 complaints through our, our um, TIP hotline. It's a, a 
1833 WeedTip. Um, we get complaints coming in of all different kinds. Um, we, we follow up on those complaints. If we need to, we'll go out and do an inspection at the site um, or we'll refer the matter to local law enforcement or a partner agency. Um, but we have received 408 of those so far this year. Now to touch on, on track and trace, I'm gonna start passing this around here. Um, what I'm passing out are um, what are called unique identifier tags, they're radio frequency ID tags. Um, as the agency responsible for overseeing the implementation of track and trace, um, we have been leading the, have led the implementation of that system. Um, that system applies to all licensing agencies, so every licensee in the state system is required to use that track and trace system. Every provisional and annual licensees, temporary licensees were not, but provisional and annual licensees are. Um, it's a management tool, compliance management tool, um, designed to track the movement of cannabis and cannabis products throughout the distribution chain. It's a cloud-hosted online software reporting system that's used by the licensees. Um, it's called California Cannabis Track and Trace System. Our vendor for that is a company called Metric. Um, those tags that I'm passing around, and if you hold them up, you can see the RFID um, code wires kind of in between, um, like in, in, the, in, in between the two layers. Um, one is a plant tag, one is a package tag. So all cannabis plants are required to be tagged um, and identified with a unique identifier. When the plants are harvested, the um, product that comes from those plants, when it goes into packages, those packages receive RFID tags. Um, if those packages are put into smaller packages, that new package has an RFID tag and on through the distribution chain. Um, as cannabis flour turns into extracted oil that eventually turns into a product, um, an edible uh, tincture, um, any other type of um, topical, all of those products when they're in packages have RFID tags that can be traced and tracked um, all the way back to the plant. Um, that's, that's the design of the system. Um, those are the tags that are being used. When, when a licensee orders tags, um, the tag will have their license number printed on it and some other coded information. Um, those uh, RFID tags can be um, read by a handheld RFID scanner by investigation staff when they're out on a site. That unique identifier number can also be queried um, in, in the metric um, database to see where the product came from. It's also important to have that in case product needs to be identified and put on hold or recalled. Um, we'll be able to know where that is in the distribution chain. Um, it can be put on hold by a, um, by a licensing authority if the product, if there's something that ends up, that we find out that's wrong with the product. Uh, let's see, on the horizon coming up for us, um, going back to the first sheet, the two, the two items that were down on the bottom said coming in 2021. So two of our um, programs that, that were created in statute, um, one is an uh, Appalachians program. So um, by January 1st, 2021, um, the CDFA needs to create a process that allows cultivators of cannabis to establish appellations of standards, practices, and cultivars. So similar to wine, um, we, we held um, Appalachian working group meetings earlier this year. We had about seven or eight meetings that we held. We went and um, contacted various association members throughout the state in all different parts of the state held these working group meetings to get a lot of input um, from these work group participants about um, their thoughts on Appalachians as we developed this program. It was really, um, we considered that a pre-rulemaking effort to really get informed as we move into starting to draft regulations. Um, we'll be doing that at the, end of the, at the end of this year, very early next year, so that we will have final rules by January 1st of 2021. So keep an eye out for that. The second program is a program um, where we, we will be creating a program that's comparable to the statewide organic program. And we'll be creating this um, program comparable for organics for cannabis. Once again, um, in this, for this effort, we used uh, the uh, California Organic Products Advisory Committee, which is under the CDFA, the COPAC. Um, last year, we approached COPAC and um, they created a cannabis subcommittee which has been advising us as we look at the regulations under the National Organic Program, 
um, and, and start to look at drafting these uh, comparable organic regulations for cannabis. The goal there is trying to make it as close to the NOP as possible. Um, there is language in the statute that, that references if cannabis is ever, um, uh, let's say, comes off the Controlled Substances Act at the federal level and falls under the NOP, then the, the comparable organics program would essentially go away and cannabis would need to fold in to the NOP. So that's why we're trying as much as we can to make this um, be as close as possible. So we've been utilizing the subcommittee under COPAC. Those are public meetings. We've had public input. Um, and, and so we're working um, toward developing those regulations. Once again, that needing to be in place by January 1st, 2021. It's gonna follow about a month um, after we start the Appalachians rulemaking because we don't wanna we, we, we want to get um, good industry input and we don't want people to get them confused, so we're staggering them each by about 30 days. Um, two final things, um, then I'll wrap up. Um, two other things on the horizon. We are currently working um, with the, um, with the uh, governor's administration, our executive office, our three licensing, all three licensing authorities, our sister agencies, the Bureau of Cannabis Cor Control and Department of Public Health, along with the Office of Innovation under uh, California Health and Human Services Agency on an initiative um, where um, Office of Innovation is working with all of us, mapping out all three agencies' processes um, for both licenses and um, taking in complaints, the, the ones I referred to earlier looking at um, how we all process this work, um, where we could create efficiencies, um, where we could create more transparency, um, where we could make it easier for uh, the public to um, navigate through the process. So we're working on that initiative right now. We're, we're very excited looking for some good um, recommendations and hopefully some good um, quick wins that we could all put in place um, after the first of the year. And then the final, um, final thing on the horizon for us is we, uh, went out for bid and awarded a contract earlier, um, uh, probably in June, um, with a company called Edelman, um, who is our contractor and working with us on an industry awareness campaign. This will be the first one that we know of in the nation where um, the campaign is going to be um, focused on getting cultivators who are not in the license system into the license system. So messaging across the industry um, to those that are that are growing of um, you know why it's good to be in the California licensed market. Um, this is all about environmental protection, protecting public health and safety, um, breaking down the stigmas of, of cannabis. Um, and so Edelman's working with us on this campaign, and we're hoping that launches sometime after the first of the year as well. So lots of things going on for us. A lot of exciting things on the horizon. Um, that concludes my update, and I'm free to answer any. Questions, well, Richard. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I know. I knew. I knew there'd be a lot of hands here. I, I really appreciate your your presentation. Um, I had two comments. One is, what percentage of the growers are not in the program in the state? Such a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, that's all we all we really have is anecdotal information. Um, you know, back when we started, we heard anywhere from, 85. yeah, fifty upwards of over fifty thousand farms. Um, you know, potentially but, but in, in the terms state. of product produce percentage wise, do you think uh, it, that that's still you know it's still, I'd say too early to to speculate just because um, we went through temporary licensing. Now we're in the middle of you know issuing either provisionals or annuals, and right. businesses are getting in their their. Um, using the track and trace system now. So we'll have a better idea in 2020 as everyone's up and running and we go through another full cycle um, of, of you know, plants in the ground and, and harvesting and, and seeing product go really from the time the plants are harvested all the way through down to retail. Um, but, you know, I think the number is still small. I think there's still a lot of work um, to be done in educating um, the the industry edu educating the businesses and getting them in and the other thing that does make it a little difficult is um, The question from the gentleman here earlier is because it is a dual licensing system in California. There are uh, still a large number of jurisdictions that um, ban 
Um, no, I agree. Yeah. So, so we're working. Um, it's definitely a work in progress, but I, I would say that the percentage is still small to what the potential is out there in the state. And, and I encourage you to get the departments working together. We've seen this in the water side as well, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to streamline and to consolidate to where, where your applicants have a better chance of succeeding with their, with their applications. Yep. So we agree. I'll open it up at this okay. point. Nancy. It's kind of an embarrassing question. Chris. What is the canopy and how do you measure it? So um, the, the canopy is, and that's a good question, thank you for asking. Um, the canopy is the area at the cultivation site where mature plants can be. So if you're, um, if you're let's say you're growing in a greenhouse and you have um, immature plants in one area and then you move them to a flowering room. So whatever room where your plants are going to be mature and flowering or if you're growing outdoors um, and you have a, a, a big open field, um, if you if you put seeds in the ground and you're growing plants and eventually that's where all of your plants will grow and flower and you'll be harvesting, the canopy is the square footage of that area where all of your mature plants are. Um, the it's it's the the square footage of that area um, and it we do. Um, your question caused a lot of debate and discussion as we were creating our regulations about what is canopy because um, the statute references the canopy um, when it talks about licenses, for instance, 500 square feet to up to 10,000 square feet of canopy. Um, so our definition of canopy goes along these lines as canopy can be, um, can be non-contiguous but needs to be, um, if, if you're separating it, um, so for instance, if you have two different areas making up your 10,000 square feet, then those areas need to be separated by an identifiable boundary. And we give examples in our regulations of what that could be, fencing, hedgerows, garden benches, things like that. But it was a hotly um, discussed topic as we were creating the regulations. So normally when we think about a canopy, we think like a tree canopy, which is the actual thing. Yes. But this is more the area where it grows, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, Interesting presentation, thank you. But on track and trace, have you guys created a you know, kind of a, a standardized unit, a, a carton, some size where you've identified or you're receiving information on a per unit cost for implementation of track and trace, both that per plant, packaged, when containerized, and all the way through retail? Because as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of some fresh produce applications that, that I'm involved with in terms of cost, scalability, and category management or inventory issues or concerns, not necessarily at the production side, but more on the receipt distribution side and retail side for, for retailers and food service. So I'm just trying to, I'm hearing some parallels here, but wanted to know some lessons you may have learned. Yeah, so um, nothing in the regulations re regarding, um, did you, you, you were asking about uniform, uniform packaging. Um, all of the products need to be in, um, a tamper-proof packaging by the time they get to retail. So the, the days of when, um, you know, back before all of this regulation in a dispensary, uh, a, a patient would go in and want to buy flour and then the person helping them would take flour out of a jar and weigh it um, and then, you know, put it in a, a sealed um, package and give that to the consumer. Well, everything that gets to retail has to be prepackaged in specific quantities. So there are requirements in the regulations. Um, what you're talking about, um, those types of statistics and metrics will be coming out of the track and trace system. Um, each licensee will be able to look at that, um, you know, if they want to kind of run some metrics on, um, you know, what's kind of coming into their business and going through it. Um, but we'll, we as regulators will be using the data in the track and trace system to kind of um, give us some benchmarks as we continue to move forward about you know, what does an average yield for a 10,000 square foot grow look like? How many, what does that look like when the plants are first harvested because they take a wet weight and then they weigh, they take a net weight after the product's dried and cured and packaged up. Um, and what does an average yield look like? Um, we'll need to be able to have some ways to determine if somebody is either inverting or diverting product into the legal system or out. Um, so, um, but it doesn't, the, the packaging requirements come from other agency regulations and it's all about 
um, once again, public safety and um, tamper resistant packaging. I'm hoping that helps. If I didn't answer your question, you could let me know. Okay, all right. Richard, maybe you gave us the information. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, t tell us a little bit about the demographics. You've got 17 licenses, um, and um, do you, uh, is uh, if you, we saw a graph, we would see how how many kind of from each of these. Do you, are there is there one that's or two that are most most popular? Are they smaller size or are they moving toward the bigger size? And I was wondering if you could also give us some sort of feel for um, the kind of fees that you're generating um, in this area. Um, so I, I think it spans pretty widely as far as what we're issuing. Um, I could, and I'll, I can work with Josh and the secretary. I do have, I didn't bring it with me, but I have um, of these current active licenses, the breakdown of what, what that's made up of, meaning small mixed light tier one specialty cottage. So I can get that for you. I just didn't bring it with me. Um, Trouble. We had a group here, I think maybe as a, a year or two ago that were really advocating for protection for is it this small, small growers, small growers. Right? I was at, I think I was here at that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it does, it does range. Um, there are some counties where um, uh, there are farmers or farms who have multiple small um, um, outdoor or mixed light license, mixed light licenses. And I think that's what you, you had heard from those groups that were here a couple years ago. Um, as far as fees, um, I have, I didn't, I have my revenue person back there. I want to say that I, I, um, I'll, once again, I'll have to get I'll have to get you the the fees, but it's in I think this last fiscal year was in the mid thirty five million dollar range um, from the fees from last fiscal year. Huh? A couple of observations uh, used to be when we had cannabis on the agenda, the um, there would be standing room only. I think that's maybe it means it's more normalized. It's like every other crop. Um, <laughs> And the second observation I make, uh, if you uh, let me, uh, President um, Cameron, is, you know, I'm a rice grower. I hate the keto diet. I just hate the keto <laughs> diet, right? Because uh, it doesn't allow for uh, rice on it. And, and I have some of my staff who are members of the keto diet. I hate that, right? I think that all of my staff should eat rice and be able to represent it. I was wondering if there's any relevance of that to your staff. <laughs> That's a good question. Huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> on, uh, yeah, and on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Anyway. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Don. Well, oh, sorry, Eric. You, you okay. Uh, I think this may be beyond the scope of your mandate, but I have been hearing a lot recently about the inability for EPA to properly register pesticides for cannabis. And um, it seems like a big problem. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that it, um, or if the state is thinking of any way of, of, you know, any kind of interim solutions for that while we resolve the issue of cannabis at the federal level. Shall, shall I? Um, so in our regulations, um, we, we reference uh, that the cultivator must follow all um, guidelines as, uh, as put out by Department of Pesticide regulation. Um, the cultivator is required to uh, submit to us as part of their application a uh, uh, pest management plan. Um, on that, they're required to list the, either the product names or active ingredients of any pesticides that they will be intending to use. Um, we work with uh, very closely with DPR on products that are um, prohibited for use because you're right, there is nothing that's um, under the federal APA, there's nothing that's legal for use on cannabis. Um, so we, we start first with what's prohibited. Um, if there's anything on that list, we would go back to the, um, to the applicant and tell them that that plan is denied. Um, if we don't see anything that is prohibited, then um, they sign, the applicant signs um, an attestation form that they will um, seek, uh, um, have conversation with their local county agricultural commissioner about the products that they'll be using, and, and we work in cooperation with the ag commissioners. Um, essentially, you know, the, I, I believe that um, DPR is looking at those products and, and looking at um, what doesn't present, a, um, I think, what they'd call a conflict in use on cannabis, but it is, it is an issue that um, will get, could get resolved one day through the federal government. Yeah. I think that's a great, you know, kind of do as the best you can sort of a solution for yeah, now, but that's what we could do. This, um, this seems like it's a problem 
that needs a, a shorter term solution <laughs> and, and maybe there's some kind of coalition of states but where I would also has been say legal. the real abuse is happening on what are still illegal grows yeah. right yeah and the one the one other thing I'd, I would add on um, as, as, a, as a, um, a final comment on that is that all of all cannabis and cannabis products do go through final form testing um, that testing is overseen by the Bureau of Cannabis Control they license those labs um, and those tests are testing for a range of pesticides, heavy metals, um, moisture content, THC levels, a whole bunch of different things. And if that product fails testing, then it can't move forward. Can't so that there is that that backstop as well. Is there any in your association of state ag secretaries? Is there any discussion of of cannabis or any sort of coalition <laughs> of states? That no, the, there was until hemp entered the picture, and now we spend all of our time on hemp. Okay. Yeah. But there was a lot, yes. Yeah, I'll never forget the uh, the comment that was made when we had the Growers Association in here before it was, uh, the law was passed. What, when they said that, you know, we used to use this material on, on cannabis, but we found out when we burned it, it turned to arsenic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm, I have the great fortune of being on Helene's advisory board at the College of Ag, and there's been a couple of presentations there in the last couple of years that, you know, if we could un unleash the power of UC Davis to solve some of these problems, it'd be great, but they can't do it. And so it's just, people are gonna get sick and hurt and, and, and then we're gonna be wondering why we didn't do something earlier. Well, Richard, thank you very much. Okay. Great thank update. You. All right, thank you very much for having me. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, Thea Rittenhouse, uh, Farm Farmer Equity. Thea is the uh, Farmer Equity Advisor for the California Department of Food and Ag. The Farmer Equity Act was created to increase support and access to resources and information for the growing number of socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers throughout California. So welcome, Thea. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to give an update. I believe the last time I was here was about one year ago. So a lot has happened since then and I'll just spend a little bit of time giving you a brief background on the Farmer Equity Act, and then talk a little bit about some things that I've done and the uh, progress thus far on the Farmer Equity Report, which is currently in progress um, and a part of that, um, that legislation that created my position. So the Farmer Equity Act, AB 1348, um, recognized and defined socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, and these Farmers and ranchers have historically been underserved and discriminated against and not included equally in terms of access to resources, information, um, for a variety of reasons. And the Farmer Equity Act also defined underserved farmers are small farms, women-owned farms, and urban farms as well. So uh, the legislation created my position and outlined that within the first year I would create a farmer, farmer equity report that will be for the governor and the legislature uh, by January, 20, January 1st of 2020, that's coming up very soon. And also that I help to better increase uh, access to resources and in, in information for these groups, help to provide training, technical assistance, um, identify opportunities for uh, better serving these groups of farmers and ranchers and work within the department to um, ensure that there is equal representation and voice um, on boards and commissions and also uh, in committees and um, uh, access to information as well in different languages. So in the first year, I've done a variety of things to help within the department just as a part of uh, this position to uh, better, better increase access to information and resources. So I've helped with some of the grant programs to uh, determine priority funding in certain grant programs. I've assisted with facilitating listening sessions in particular um, for a, a technical assistance grant to help better facilitate engagement and interaction and feedback from groups that were applying for technical assistance grants that were bid to serve uh, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And I also helped with uh, some of the other grant programs that CDFA offers to uh, help, help them define priorities, review RFPs and grant opportunities to ensure that 
uh, if they were targeting either socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers or communities and or um, organizations that work with these groups of farmers and ranchers that there would be more opportunities for those groups to apply for grants and other programs that CDFA offers such as the specialty crop block grant um, so I was able to help with the specialty crop block grant program to create a new RFP this year to target organizations that work with these groups of farmers and ranchers and particularly for organizations who had not applied for that grant funding before that they would have assistance in both applying for the grant and also for the duration of the grant to have um, technical assistance by CDFA staff to be able to uh, implement their programs. As you may or may not know, that's an um, important pot of money for uh, nonprofit organizations that work with farmers and ranchers. Um, and oftentimes there's organizations that don't have um, the technical assist, uh, knowledge to be able to apply and write grants. Um, additionally, uh, the Office of Environmental Farming, I've helped them a bit with their RFPs for the Healthy Soils Program, SWEEP, and others. And now there is a, or has been since I started actually, uh, a prioritization for projects that, or farmers that apply for this funding that are socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So one thing that I noticed right away when I started at CDFA is uh, that there, there's a lot of information on the website and that there is not a lot of direction if, I, if you are a farmer coming to this website to better understand um, the ways that CDFA can help me as a farmer or a rancher and uh, to better understand the resources that are available to to, to, uh, to farmers. So what I did uh, was to create a separate web page, and it's displayed here. And this takes existing information, so I didn't create anything new uh, in terms of content. What I did was I reorganized how it, how it is and create a farmer resource portal so that if I were a farmer that needed to know some something about uh, whether it's access to um, uh, access to grant programs that CDFA offers, just general information, what does CDFA, what can CDFA do for me as a farmer? Uh, also USDA grant and loans and programs, which as a partner agency offers very similar um, services uh, for farmers and ranchers. And additionally, a link for boards and commissions. And uh, what I did under this page was to actually index them. Currently they're under multiple different pages and based on the program and it's very hard to find information and the reason that I'm focusing a bit on boards and commissions and committees is that uh, the piece of the Farmer Equity Act is to ensure that farmers and ranchers have a voice on uh, decision making and policies and boards and commissions and committees are a big part of that. So. What I did here was index uh, these boards and commissions. So if I were a farmer and wanted to join one of those, currently the only way to do that is to sign up for a press release to when, when those positions are advertised. You can do that there. Uh, certainly there are grant programs for farmers. I tried to categorize them based on the ones that are available just for farmers at the top and going down uh, some of the other ones that are available for nonprofit organizations and research institutes, like FREP, Fertilizer Research and Education, and CNIP, which is also for farmers markets, <clears throat> and the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. Additionally, this page here uh, is the, the actual resources and information for, for farmers and ranchers. If you are a farmer, and you want to know how to sell at a farmer's market, well, you may need to go here and look for some more information about what you need to do uh, in order to do that. So currently, well, that information didn't exist before, but I linked back to the resources that you can find more information about how to do that. Uh, and then also the, the USDA grant and loan programs. And this one is important because many of the USDA loan and grant programs prioritize funding for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers 
veteran farmers here. They also have information for beginning farmers. Um, and we recently added a, um, I don't think it's live yet, but uh, wildfire resources information. Oh, here it is, wildfire recovery resources. <clears throat> So this, this page is not quite yet complete in that a major goal of my position is also to increase information in other languages, Spanish being a very important language to start to include uh, resources and information about what CDFA offers and has for farmers. And so I am a part of the website committee that is uh, moving forward with different um, things related to the transition of the CDFA webpage to be ADA compliant and other things, but uh, there is a, a plan to add the both a Google Translate, but also to have this page mirrored in Spanish. So we're just, um, there's a little bit of a time lapse in getting things ADA compliant, but that will be happening soon. And so uh, additionally, there will be a place to sign up for a newsletter here. Once that has been uh, fixed on the technical side of things, um, the content is all ready, so I'll have a newsletter and that will be um, in English and Spanish and hopefully some other languages in the future. And there is also contact information here for more information. That's actually my work cell. And I wanted to have a direct number for people to be able to contact. And I've already had five farmers call me on this number. So I feel like it's a good resource to have. Um, and I asked how they found the number and they said they just did a search for farmer resources. and so. I was happy to be able to refer them to other, either groups within CDFA or other resources that they needed. Very importantly here also, and I'll mention this in related to access to other languages, CDFA also has concurrently hired a, a person in public affairs to focus on Spanish language outreach. And he's created a Twitter account. And so we're having information going, going out in Spanish in the Twitter and also all of the, uh, press releases are also being translated to Spanish. And this is an important first step. There's a lot of uh, farmers and ranchers who are Spanish speaking in the state and hopefully more of them will start reading our press releases as a result. Um, so those were all the things, that's, that was one of the major um, accomplishments that I worked on earlier this year. Now part of the legislation also mandated that I write a report for the governor and the legislature on CDFA's efforts to serve socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers by January 1st of 2020. So my idea uh, for this report is, was to be able to tell a story of CDFA's efforts and at the same time highlight many of these farmers and ranchers that we're talking about here. So I have conducted five sets of interviews and I'll just throw out some numbers here. <laughs> but uh, in particular, like, I wanted to highlight farmers and their farmer profiles. So I interviewed uh, quite a few farmers. Um, I, uh, there were 15 interviews with 32 separate farmers and these were interviews all around the state and these were um, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers of just about every crop you can imagine, including cannabis. <laughs> um, and six of those farmers were women, uh, sole oper principal operators were, were women as well. And they were a uh, range of sizes of operations and locations, urban and rural, greenhouse, field operations. Um, and uh, I tried to do more in-depth interviews knowing that there's so many farmers around the state and the biggest challenge that I've heard most often is it's so hard for people to find these farmers. So I just wanted to be able to spend a little bit more in-depth time with these farmers, go to their farm, talk to them. Some of them I've, I knew before, but others I didn't know and uh, be able to better understand some of their challenges and capture those in this report. Um, to have a better, a bigger impact and to really kind of set a precedent to, to, as to why it's important to showcase the work of these, these farmers across the state. I, I also did uh, uh, three other sets of interviews um, with, uh, to, to showcase interagency collaboration with other government agencies. So we're talking about collaboration on important issues related to farmers and ranchers. 
uh, seven interviews with interagency other government agencies, 13 interviews with partner organizations that CDFA works with direct, that they do the direct um, assistance with farmers and ranchers, so like cooperative extension, resource conservation districts, Farm Bureau, a lot of those groups, I, I um, and many of those I visited in person uh, to do those interviews, as well as support staff that work within those partner organizations to directly work uh, with socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers to highlight the real, the very important role that these groups play and these people play on the ground. Whereas CDFA cannot play that role, these groups are doing that. Also, 15 interviews with CDFA staff, a big piece of the report is to showcase how CDFA is serving these farmers and ranchers. So. As I'm new to CDFA uh, and the government in general, um, I wanted to better understand how each different division and program works and how, you know, what kind of strategies they use or the way that they're thinking about addressing uh, this issue based on, you know, the different things and activities that their program does or their division. Um, and then I did a, in order to better understand boards and commissions and uh, op access and opportunities uh, to joining and barriers to joining boards, commissions, and committees. I conducted a survey w of all of CDFA's uh, board, commission, and committee members. And I got 106 responses, which is fairly, fairly decent. Um, and I'm in the process right now of finishing the draft of this report, and then uh, it will be submitted to the governor for review and public in January, so I would be delighted to come back in the beginning of next year to tell you more about the report itself and give you a summary and answer any further questions. But um, does anyone have any questions for me today? Sophia, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, to compliment you on all the work you've done here. It's really impressive to uh, see you reaching out like that. Just curious, what do you, I mean, do you get a general feeling for what the one or two big issues are in the small, I guess the disadvantaged farmers, what what theme do you keep hearing or access, keep coming up? Uh, access to land. Access and, to uh, land? Yep, access to land and capital, land tenure. Many stories of farmers leasing land and having that being taken away. Taken away yeah. Even when it's planted in permanent crops. So That's interesting. Perennial herbs, yeah. Hmm. Fascinating. So access, yeah, access to land and capital and um, marketing, uh, you know, access to markets and, and information about marketing and selling products. And many of these interviews were, you know, not conducted in English, so right. that is language is a barrier in, in this case. Mm -hmm. no, I, I agree with you. Don? Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Um, a question, you mentioned the, uh, this appears to be CDFA-centric, but a very important part of the interface is the partners that are non-CDFA. And is that linkage there on that website? For instance, you know, we've got the universities, we've got UCANR, and um, I didn't really see that on here. Is, is this more, is it on there? And I would I hope it would be, because it would be more of a one-stop. That's correct, and that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that, because um, the thing that I forgot to say, the second phase of this, this is CDFA centric and USDA centric, specifically d designed to help better organize the information that is available for, for farmers here. But the second phase of this will be an interactive map um, that will have uh, the different regions and uh, providers as well as um, links to um, th those organizations. Then you are, you are serving uh, minority mm -hmm. farmers, and many of those grow very special type crops. Mm -hmm. Do you try to interface with like uh, UC or ANR on the hiring of those people? You know, those uh, cooperative uh, extension people. Do you? Well, that, that's something. <laughs> Question. That was a loaded question. I will say that in my interviews that I uh, conducted, that certainly um, is something very important that I'll be highlighting in the report, the value and importance of hiring direct um, 
provider, serve technical assistance providers that not only speak multiple languages, but have the experience um, and, and understanding of the different cultural barriers as well, crop, you know, understanding of different crops and things like that. So, yes, thank you. Sophia, uh, Rochelle had to leave, but she had a question oh, sure. that she left with me before uh, she left. Uh, and, and it relates to the Hmong farmers mm -hmm. in, the San, in the San Joaquin Valley. That there's quite a few, especially in Fresno County, that I'm aware of. But um, I'm just hoping that you can translate uh, some of the work you've done into Hmong so that they'll have access as well. Yes, yeah, so certainly that language is very important um, and very common in the Fresno area. Um, right now, the UC uh, Cooperative Extension Office in Fresno has developed quite a few languages in Hmong, um, but certainly this information here, it would we would like to be able to translate it to multiple languages. Having the Google Translate button here in the future will uh, begin to address right. that, but um, that, that helps. It, it that helps some. Not uh, always correct. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks again for coming in, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you next year. Oh yes, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, other business. We have a uh, draft letter, uh, the California Water Res uh, Resiliency Portfolio. Uh, in your packet. Have you had a chance to look at that? I see we have some comments that came in as well. We have comments from uh, board members. Chris? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thought um, staff did a fantastic job kind of encapsulating most of what we heard throughout the um, water resiliency portfolio sessions. But if I'm Looking at the effects section of the letter, which is top of page two, I see Sigma. We heard that everywhere. But where we go to um, you know, Bay Delta Plan water quality control updates and CV salt specifically, it becomes very, very parochial and for good reason, but very narrow to concerns of, of the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, but the great Central Valley. And I think that's fine, but I think we're leaving out some other top tier issues for other major ag production regions of the state, inclusive of the Central Coast where I'm at right now, where all of these issues are big, but as big on an acute basis is your water quality regulatory programs, most notably through the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, which is, you know, it's in different phases, different levels of maturity in all the different regional boards throughout the state, but I do think it's top tier enough to be referenced from a water quality perspective if this letter is supposed to take a statewide tone. So that's a suggestion that I have, and then relating to that suggestion, and I don't know how it best fits, but you know, to the extent the board and um, the secretary believe that the parameter of the water resiliency portfolio is inclusive of maybe the implementation phase of the drinking water component that ag has been supportive of in terms of water and water resiliency, and given the fact that we spent quite a bit of attention on that issue with our, our Fresno section, there, there should be some consideration of incorporating that somewhere here where it fits the portfolio. Thanks, Chris. I, I just want to mention because the October meeting, which would have been in Imperial County, got canceled, and there is a very significant top 10 county where their water issues are very specific to Colorado River and Salton Sea. And Arturo and I just went there last week, so it's top of mind. Do we have uh, additional comments? Yeah, I, I want to add, uh, I was a little concerned about the letter in terms of the generalities uh, of it and not enough specificity. Um, and um, we had had a um, subcommittee, water subcommittee meeting uh, to talk about the water resilience portfolio and we, we discussed a number of of subjects which I believe came up in the in the hearings and I'll just kind of go through some of these and I I think it's important to have a little more specificity in in, in a letter that we might send on one was ensure access to safe drinking water I think we all agree with that we want to support it and and make sure that um, that um, that the the money is is spent where it needs to be spent to benefit the most people uh, number two would be to enhance and expand infrastructure for multiple benefits. And 
which would include supporting additional storage above and below ground, uh, above and below the ground, uh, for example, Sites Reservoir, Los Vaqueros. Uh, groundwater recharge is another important area where the permitting process needs to be simplified, uh, especially for diversions of floodwaters, and uh, hopefully there will be some support for funding of, and grants uh, to, uh, to support the necessary uh, recharge uh, infrastructure. Uh, there is obviously support for conveyance uh, north of the delta to the south and also across the valleys. Uh, there are opportunities, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, to do that. Um, we would like to see facil more facilitation of pro programmatic permitting for restoration projects. Uh, there are many of them coming on the drawing board, especially in the voluntary agreement process, and, and there hopefully will be facilitation of that. Uh, and then uh, r support for reactivating the floodplains. Uh, that, that is really getting uh, a lot of uh, publicity and, and there's, there's tremendous benefits. Uh, also f facilitating water transfers. And uh, last but not uh, the least important, uh, as important as uh, technology and data. Uh, we've got to support the broadband connectivity in the, in the, in the rural areas. Um, and with SB 7X and measurement, uh, we've got to have ways to, to, to transmit that data on a, on a real-time basis. Um, then then uh, the voluntary agreement process, uh, we need to continue to support the importance and the conclusion of the uh, voluntary agreement negotiation process and uh, in that process ensure that there's representation of all uh, interested parties in the process. And uh, I, I believe so far that that's happening. Uh, we also had a fair amount of discussion on Sigma. And um, it was felt that we needed to make sure that the process is completely transparent and the local voices are heard. Um, the, the role of the state in that process needs to be more clearly defined. And hopefully, there will be financial and regulatory, well, financial support uh, in the future. And, and again, expedite the regulatory process and, uh, and then do additional research once, once the uh, implementation phase starts. Um, Sigma mandates need funding. Uh, and again, sig simplify and clarify the permitting process. Uh, and minimize the number of fallowed acres. Uh, that's important. I know that uh, public policy institutes projecting 500,000 acres are going out of production and, and if we can minimize that, uh, we'd, we'd love to see that because uh, every acre out of production impacts the rural economy, not just the growers, but, but the communities. And, um, and the last uh, would be to incentivize fallowed ground, uh, not just uh, require fallowing, but to incentivize the fallowing. And I don't know if anyone has anything they want to add to that. You can give this to Josh. Well, yeah, so if I Pretty could. comprehensive um, list. Definitely. And I think from uh, the staff perspective, I think given the timing that the draft of the water portfolio should may be coming out in a couple of weeks, it was our, my assumption that we should raise the issue from the board standpoint of the importance of the agricultural sector and the impact to it, and then maybe comment on the public comment draft of the recommendations that are out there with the more specific recommendations that we have. I agree. That, with was, that. that, that was the approach that I was intending. Yeah. So that we said this letter now and then follow up uh, during the comment period with specific uh, issues that we'd like to see addressed. That, uh, that would be my suggestion from staff side because I assume that the public document should be coming out for comment soon. But very hopeful within the next two weeks. Yeah, so that gives us an opportunity to review. Th On the record. On the record, two <laughs> weeks. We're hopeful. So then that gives us an opportunity to kind of look at all of the recommendations they have, align them with where we're at and where kind of specific needs are. So as a board, how do you feel about that? Do you want to, uh, Joy? Um, <clears throat> first of all, is there a, w I think that that's a really great strategy. Is there a way to say that in the letter that we have specific ideas that we would want to have the opportunity to convey so that we don't seem so well, I, vague? I think without having seen the final draft, it would be better to say um, we look forward to the release of the public document for further comment 
as we see necessary. I and love that, that way you let them know that, that way they understand like there's more coming. Perfect wording, okay. perfect wording. And I just also want to underscore how incredibly happy I am that the um, that we were very specific on the impact on farm workers, farm worker communities. Right. So that was really, really great. It's, it, it, it is the rural communities. It's not just farm workers. Exactly. I mean, the business owners. Yeah, we, are all we realize that. it's everyone. All right. Shall, uh, do we have a motion to move ahead on this to submit it as? Uh, with the amendment, with the slight changes there. Are you comfortable leave, waiting for your comments till later? Yeah, if we have another bite at the apple and we said we would, then yes. Right, as long as we have a chance to submit it uh, once, it's, uh, once it's released and get specific. All right, second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. All right. Um, sorry? Are we incorporating Christopher Monk or no? No. No, we're, as okay. yeah, as is, just with the comment too, that, that we want to submit additional comments that we will be uh, following the release. Um, the other issue we had before us, uh, I think we, we've instructed staff to look at the uh, possibly work with uh, the wine grape growers and any other maybe affected industry on uh, the nighttime lighting regulations that are being proposed and report back at the next meeting. I think that's understood. All right. Anything else uh, the board would like to address? We have a tentative one. If I may, um, we have uh, proposed 2020 meeting dates that are in the packet on the right-hand right. side left, right-hand pocket. Uh, um, so, uh, looking at the schedule, there is the opportunity for possibly two back-to-back um, -back meetings, March 31st, April 1st, and June 30th and July 1st. Um, my only concern about the July 1st one is if people are taking vacation early um, for the holiday, that's always an issue. And June and July has always been difficult for a quorum with the board. Is there any interest? It's been a few years since the board um, went to the World Ag Expo and did a listening session. If there's any interest in that, that would mean a mm. week delay. But it's been a few years. For the February meeting? Hmm? I'll just throw it out for consideration. Yeah, I think it's a good place to be. And I'm looking right now. It'll be around like the 12th, 13th. So it's the 11th through the 13th. Or maybe we should do it at Calusa instead of first day. <laughs> so it would be the first day, which would be, the Tuesday would be the 11th instead of the 4th. So it would be February 11th versus February 4th. And that would be the first day of the expo. Okay. It's the 11th through the 13th. So it would just be the 11th. They probably have the opening, yeah, the opening uh, ceremony. and Rain and mud. We, we hope we hope it's ra we hope it's rain and mud. <laughs> you guys, it is summer out there today. It is unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. You would, uh, you would let us all RVs that we would park over in the front lot. Well, that's another story. Um, Still helicopters. Yeah. That is one of the most popular events of uh, California. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, it's next cool. to impossible. So, um, yeah. going back, work on it. Uh, is this for 2020 or 21? Yes, back for the meeting We're dates. Use the yes. Lundberg Rice Jack to get us there. So, what is the uh, board's preference so we can start to schedule and I can give confirmed schedule out? For which preference for what? Do we want to do the two-day meeting option or not? Would be the first question. What's the purpose? What are we going to do exactly? Yes. Okay. 
And and what? Maybe make it a May. Well, I mean, maybe a May, a two-day meeting in May or or April. I, I really would encourage the board, and it's another place that's not easy to get to, but to understand just to scratch the surface of Colorado River and Salton Sea is a mm -hmm. pretty enlightening experience. Yeah. Well, if we if we do that, that should be early in, early enough in the year to where it's not 120. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it'll only be 95. No, but you're right. That's a great, great idea. So that two-day meeting would be. There's a lot down there that uh, I think would be pretty. Okay, so we'll. <laughs> oh no, we're gonna be standing in Calixi. Calixi. Oh, yeah. Josh knows this restaurant. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so moving the February 4th date to February 11th to be with the Ag Show. Yep. Um, doing the two-day meeting March 31st and April 1st to do the Salton Sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we stick to the one-day schedule for the rest of the yeah. year. Perfect. That's a proposal? Okay. Yes, after it's finalized. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. All right. <laughs> yeah. Day one and day two. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, get, you get both perspectives that way. Okay, uh, we have additional public comment uh, listed. We have anyone that would like to address the board? Please uh, come up, state your name, and if you're affiliated, uh, let us know. Good afternoon, and uh, my name's uh, Thor Bailey, and some of you probably know of me, and I've been involved in literally chasing what I call a biomass uh, reduction mirage for way too long, starting in 1981. And actually did a lot of work with way back with Vashek Zervankins, Food and Ag, and Steve Schaefer. And so I'm not here for an ask or a request today, but we were next door working with the Strategic Growth Council and a, a yeah. And so I'm with the Green Carbon Nexus group, which is sort of a, a group of groups that's been around several years roughly 40, almost 40. And um, what we're in the process of, of what I just wanted to do is give an announcement that working with, down in Chowchilla with this uh, University of Merced is we're trying to bring some sanity to all this biomass reduction and the bark beetle issue has created all kinds of problems for agriculture, which had problems before the bark beetle issue. And I think what we're proposing with a smaller scale, how do we scale down more farmer friendly uh, near the, either on the farm or near the farm. And I think one of the things that I know Don's been real involved and others with biochar and biochar is unfortunately, it's not the magic bullet that everybody uh, is representing it to be. Although it, uh, as a product done correctly, it's, it's, you can't go wrong in making biochar, but you also can't make any money at it right now. And I think the Catch-22, and I just wanted to explain a little bit about our project, the Catch-22 is right now with the uh, renewable energy portfolio, and cap and trade, and the state's regulations, you've got to be able to track your carbon footprint and reduction and document it. Well, ag biomass scale down where the farmers uh, actually are the real beneficiaries in the closed loop recycling from, you know, literally from the orchard through the pyrolysis unit back in either to the field or we're explaining that I think the path of least resistance is probably water filtration and working as an example with Caltrans because they have water runoff issues throughout the state while we're working on, when I say we, everybody at uh, CDFA included on biochar as a soil, not a soil amendment, but a soil additive. So our, um, our group is uh, uh, one, ben, uh, ben Wellos, he's with uh, Caltrans and engineer. He came up with the design and the need and he's uh, his cousin's a farm in the valley putting together the uh, water filtration uh, runoff off of freeways 
and we're using our Chowchilla project as a flagship project, although there's projects up and down the state. But I was going to ask if, if there was an ask, um, at least to plant a seed, that we think that if there was a way that probably combined with um, the USDA rural development and their value add programs is if we could come up with a, might be a stretch, but adding value to prunings. And I think the prunings are the biggest problem because they're seasonal, they're spread all over, and they've always been the bigger problem because they're hard to deal with. And so there's no path of adding value to prunings, excuse me, although there's a lot of value added acceptance for, for uh, crops. So we feel that prunings are an extension of the crop. You can't get the crop unless you produce the prunings, vice versa. And that's where, uh, just wanted to let you know that we'll have more information as the project uh, expands our role. I'm with uh, Green Carbon Nexus out of Chico, and our role is to be kind of the community outreach, public relations, and uh, explaining what we're doing down in Chowchilla. So if there were any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But as I mentioned, there wasn't really an ask. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we'll adjourn our meeting. Thank you all for attending. It's good to see you again, and uh, see you uh, December. We'll uh, see what we uh, we'll come up with for uh, the Monday night. How's that? So thank you.